Hi everyone, Ross Satchel from Microchip back again. Welcome to episode 8 in our AVR bare metal programming series. In the previous video, episode 7, we made a low power blinky with the Tiny 2 and we did this with each of the real time counter, RTC, and the periodic interval timer, PIT. We then compared the power measurements taken so far, including those from last episode. Finally, we found the lowest current consumption possible for the Tiny 2, which we measured it at about 250 nanoamps, or a quarter or 0.25 of a microamp. In this video, we will switch to the AVRDD and use the same bare metal process to set up the clock to run at 32.768 kHz, and of course we'll output the clock signal as a sanity test. Then we will set up the USAR peripheral to write hex values to the terminal. After that, we will implement a way to send formatted strings using printf by changing the output stream. So let's get started. Create a new bare metal project using the AVRDD, just as we did with earlier Tiny2 projects. We will create a function and its prototype for main clock control. Let's jump to the datasheet to see which registers we need to write to. Since the procedure is very similar to that of the Tiny2, I will skip the functional description and go straight to the register summary. Since a focus of this series is low power, I will continue to use the 32.768 kHz ultra low power internal oscillator for this project. So in main clock control A, we want to use the clock out as a sanity check, and we want to use the 32.768 kHz internal oscillator. Then in main clock control B, we will disable the prescaler since we want the maximum frequency. Main clock control C is all about clock failure detection, which we don't need in this example. Then there's some clock registers for interrupt control and status, which we don't need. Then there's the internal high frequency oscillator control A register, and then some PLL registers and extra control registers, which we're not using in this example. Finally, I need to set the clock out pin as an output. So I need to go to section three of the datasheet, IO multiplexing and considerations. In the table, I can look in the signal column for clock out, and I can see that it corresponds to pin PA7. I can set that pin as an output, just like we have in previous episodes in this series. Now we need to call that main clock control function in our main function. Let's program the device and check the clock frequency using our logic analyzer. So we'll take a sample with my logic analyzer, and we can see the clock output is 32 kilohertz, which is what we expected. Next we want to set up the USAR peripheral module. So this time I will show you a different way to access some of the AVR documentation. Direct your browser to onlinedocs.microchip.com. In the find in list search bar at the top of the page, type in writing C code for AVR and then click on the link for block diagram navigation to peripheral tech briefs, then the block diagram link. You'll then see an AVR block diagram and a series of links on the left side which include the tech brief getting started with writing C code for AVR MCUs, along with a bunch of getting started with tech briefs on various peripherals. Since in this episode we're focusing on USART, we can click that link on the left, or we can click on the USART N section of the block diagram to go to the tech brief. It briefly explains that while the USART is a complex peripheral and can work in various modes, this document will cover asynchronous mode. So let's quickly cover what that is, since that's what we're going to be doing. In the context of USART, asynchronous means that a clock signal is not used. This means that both ends of a data transfer need to agree on the data rate before transmissions can begin, otherwise the data will be garbled. Also, start and stop bits are included on each packet of data to ensure reliable data transmission. Just for context, synchronous means that a clock signal is used along with the data line. This means that predefined data rates, start and stop bits are no longer required so the data can be sent continuously. The signal description in the overview tells us that the USART has four pins, receive, RX, transmit, TX, clock, XCK, and direction, XDIR. Note that the clock pin is only used in synchronous mode, and that the direction pin is only used in RS-485 mode, both of which we're not using. 
Then it mentions half duplex and full duplex, so let's quickly cover those as well. Half duplex allows communication between both ends, but the communication can only go in one direction at a time. A good example of this would be walkie-talkies, where both parties can talk to each other, but only one can talk at a time. Full duplex allows communication between both ends, except this time the communication can go in both directions at the same time. A good example of this would be a phone, where both parties can talk and listen at the same time. Let's take a look at the block diagram to get an idea of how the USAR peripheral works. In blue, there are registers that we can write to or read from. For our purposes in this video, we will just be transmitting, so we can write to the board register, which then feeds the fractional board rate generator. That then works with the transmit shift register, the parity generator, and pin control to transmit data. There's a note below that saying the most common USAR configuration is 9600 8N1, which is a board rate of 9600 bits per second, and each frame consists of 8 data bits, no parity, and 1 stop bit. So a typical USART data frame is made up of 1 start bit, 8 data bits, 1 stop bit, giving it a total of 10 bits. This means that an 8N1 configuration will transmit the board rate divided by 10 ASCII characters per second. A little further down the page are some equations for calculating the board rate and board register setting. We will use the equation highlighted in orange. So the board rate or frequency is the product of 64 and the peripheral clock, then that is divided by the product of S and the board register setting. There's a note below that S in asynchronous mode is 16 in normal clock mode and 8 in double clock mode. I will be using normal mode. Note that there is a column labeled conditions, and in asynchronous mode, the board frequency must be less than or equal to the peripheral clock frequency divided by S, which was 16. So since we're using a 32.768 kHz clock, that means the maximum board rate we can use with the low power oscillator is 2048 bits per second. A commonly used value below that is 1200 bits per second, so I'll use that. So now we want to calculate the board register value, and that's in the right column. So it's the product of 64 in our peripheral clock, which was 32,768 Hz. And that is divided by the product of S, which was 16, and our board frequency, which is 1200. So that calculation comes out to 109.227. But since we need to write an integer value to the board register, we should include a roundup value of 0.5 so that anything that has a decimal part of 0.5 or more will be effectively rounded up when the floating point number is truncated when it's cast to a 16-bit integer. And of course, anything that has a decimal part of less than 0.5 will then be effectively rounded down when cast from a float to an integer. So we can use the preprocessor directive to define a function that will be used to write the fixed point float to the board register so that the fractional board rate generator can set the correct board rate. But before we do that, I'm going to add another preprocessor directive macro that defines the peripheral clock to be used in the board calculation. I'm mainly doing this so we can see the equation match the code. And if the user decides to change the peripheral clock speed, they can do that in the main clock control function and in this define. And furthermore, it avoids the use of magic numbers in the code. So the line of code is the function name, usart0 underscore board underscore rate, then it's parameter, board underscore rate, and then that's defined as the product of the peripheral clock, which is cast as a float, and 64.0. Then that whole thing is divided by the product of S, which was 16.0, and the required board rate cast as a float. Finally, we add the 0.5 to the whole thing as a roundup, as I mentioned earlier. Now let's see what we have to do to initialize the USART. Let's quickly jump to the AVRDD datasheet to see device-specific implementation. So let's open section 27, USART functional description. For full duplex mode, we need to, one, set the board rate in the board register, 2. Set the frame format and mode of operation in the control C register. 3. Configure the TX pin as an output. 
or enable the transmitter and receiver in the control B register. Now we're just doing the transmitter in this video, so I won't be setting up the receiver, but if you need to, you can simply follow this process to set it up. Let's jump to the USART register summary. So the control C register is for normal mode, and we can see there is C mode or communications mode. The options we are interested in are synchronous and asynchronous. Then there's P mode or parity, and we can disable it or set it as odd or even. Then there's SB mode or stop bit mode, where we can select one or two stop bits. Then we have CH size or character size, which allows us to set the number of data bits in a frame. We have five, six, seven, eight, and nine bits, where nine is then broken into two bytes. Then there was the control B register, where we needed to enable the transmitter, which is bit six. Then we have to enable the TX pin as an output. So first we need to know which port and pin name the TX for USART 0 corresponds to. Let's jump to section three, IO multiplexing and considerations. There is a table with the pinouts listed. If we go to the column labeled USART N, the first value is the USART instance, and the second value is whether it's TX or RX. Notice that some of the pin designations have a number three in parentheses next to it. If we click on one of those threes, it takes us to the notes below the table, which tells us that these are alternate pin positions and that we should refer to the port mux, or port multiplexer section. But before we do that, since we're using a Curiosity Nano, let's jump to the hardware user guide. So in MPLAB X, we can just click on the kit window and click on the link for the AVR64DD32 Curiosity Nano hardware user guide. Open the bookmarks in the PDF and click on the hardware description which has the pinout of the AVRDD Curiosity Nano. We can see USART 0TX corresponds to pin PD4. So then back in the data sheet, in the IO multiplexing table, we can go to the row for pin PD4 and we can see it has the little three next to it. So we know that it's on an alternate pin position. So now let's go to section 17 port mux and we can jump to the register summary the register that applies here is USART Route A. The three least significant bits correspond to USART 0, and we need to look up pin PD4 under TX, and that is ALT3. Since our USART initialization will be 1200 NUN81, I will start with the control C register. Even though some of the fields used are defaults, I want to be explicit so there's no confusion about the settings. So we are using asynchronous in the C mode bit field. The P mode bit field is disabled, meaning no parity. And the CH size bit field is 8 bit. We want one stop bit in the SB mode bit. Next is the board rate, and we can just call that macro we defined earlier from the equation and just pass it the board rate value of 1200. Since we are using the AVRDD Curiosity Nano, I will set the TX pin PD4 as an output. This is just like we have uh, set LEDs as an output using the DIR set register. Then we need to write to the port mux USART route A register, and we were using the port mux USART 0 ALT 3 group configuration. Finally, we need to enable the TX in the USART 0 control B register using the USART underscore TX enable bitmask. Now that's the initialization driver taken care of, we still need to be able to send a character. Let's jump back to the online docs block diagram navigation to peripheral tech briefs and then open the getting started with USART. Scroll down the page until you see USART 0 send char function. Now all it's doing here is it checks the inverse of the USART 0 status register bitwise anded with the USART DREIF bitmask. Then if that resolves to true or 1, it stays in that while loop. Then when it resolves to false or 0, it breaks out of the while loop and then it writes the char to the USART 0 TX data low register. But let's back up a bit there. What's the USART DREIF bitmask? Let's jump to MPLAB X in the header file 
as well as the data sheet to find out. So first to find the AVRDD header file, it's similar to what we did in episode two, with the tiny two. So we do pound include, then the name is AVR forward slash IO AVR 64DD32.h. Then control click to follow it. Now control F to find, then enter USART underscore DREIF. There are two results, one for the bit mask and one for the bit position. The value of the bit mask is hex 20 and the bit position is the fifth bit. Now let's go back to the data sheet, USART register summary again, and open the status register. We can see bit 5 is the DREIF flag, which is the USART data register empty interrupt flag. So that bit of code checks if the USART TX register is not empty. If that is true, then it waits until that is true. And when it is, it then will send the next character. So we can add that to our code, and don't forget to add a function prototype. Now in our main function after main clock control function call, we can then call the USART TX init function. Then I will create an 8-bit unsigned integer called print value and initialize that to hex 0. Then in the while one loop, I will call the USART senchar function, passing it print value and post incrementing it. Now build the project, program the device and open data visualizer. Click on your COM port, then in the settings, set the board rate to 1200 and confirm your settings are 8 data bits, no parity and 1 stop bit. Then click the terminal tab and in the source drop down select your COM port. Then in the display as drop down select hex values. You will see it count up from 0 hex to FF, then wrap around again to 0 and start counting again. Now that's working. Let's see how to implement a printf function so we can send formatted strings to the terminal. This time I'll open the PDF of TB3216, getting started with USART, link in the description below. So let's open section 4, send formatted strings slash send string templates using printf. It tells us that this is a common use case for an application to send a string with variable fields and that this is a very flexible approach which reduces the number of lines of code. We can accomplish this by changing the output stream of the printf function. The steps are straightforward. We need to configure the USART peripheral, which we've already done, then create a user-defined stream, then replace the standard output stream with the user-defined stream. There's a few code snippets that show below the needed code. So first we need to include standard io.h library, then we need to define the user stream. Then we use the code that we used earlier in the usart senchar function to write the individual characters to the usart buffer. So let's copy both of those code snippets and jump back to MPLABX and paste them in. We need to put the include standard io.h and the new user stream at the top of our code. Then since I already have the usart0 senchar function, I can just call that in the usart0 print char function and pass it the parameter character, and don't forget the function prototype. Then the last thing is redirecting the data stream to our new user stream. Then in our main function we can call printf, write a string and add a variable. I'll use the same one as before called print value. Since this works like a normal printf, I can use %d as the format specifier for an integer. Now program the device and open data visualizer, and we can see our printf data streaming. In the next episode, we will break out our peripheral libraries into separate header and source files so they can be used easily in multiple different projects, which will be very useful for our final videos. See you in the next video.